This is a special edition upload of the Game Sports Show broadcasted through thegamesportshow.com, Spotify Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, the Podbean platform including Facebook and Instagram. This bonus content is brought to you by Compass Imaging Group and Demansky Office Interiors. We are thankful that you are tuned into the game with these special edition uploads being broadcasted or recorded outside of the show's usual schedule, but we will caution the listeners that viewer discretion is advised in terms of potential language that may be offensive. Otherwise, we warn you to be prepared for some electric content that the Game Sports Show always provides. Now, let's send it over to David McKegg Jr. and the crew in the Game Sports Show studio. Booyah, and it's time for the Game Sports Show, the Twin Sioux's only local, regional, and national sports show. It is your host, David McKegg Jr., coming to you from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. You're listening to the game through www.thegamesportshow.com or through our media, social media platforms, including Spotify, Apple, Podbean, Facebook, and or Instagram. You may have also been directed to the show through our broadcast partners, ESPN 1400, Sovereign Communications, or on TV. Either way, we're very happy you're able to join us for this edition of the game, as it is a special edition upload of the Game Sports Show. Special edition uploads of the game being broadcasted out of the show's typical schedule that focuses on an interview with a guest or guests that are known in the world of sports, locally, regionally, nationally, or professionally. The game is brought to you by our fantastic sponsor, Sponsors, Northern Superior Brewing Company, Compass Imaging Group, Demansky Office Interiors, Sports Center Bar and Grill, Thrush Creative, North Shore Sports and Auto, Northern Quitters in Need, and of course our amazing broadcast partners ESPN, ESPN 1400, Sovereign Communications, and On TV. I will be your host, Board Op, and quote unquote tech guy for the show. Now getting to our special guest and most likely the main reason why you hit play on this link of the game, not just to hear my voice, but someone whom I just got acquainted with, a well-known hockey player in particular at the University of Michigan NCAA men's hockey team, Dexter Danks. Dexter, thanks for joining us and how's it going? David, what's going on? Thanks for having me. Of course. Now I know you're in North Vancouver right now, correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so I know you're three hours behind us, obviously, so it's still some daylight for you where it's getting a little darker here in Sault Ste. Marie, and obviously, it is dark times in general, that's kind of segue, and obviously, the world of sports is the world in general with COVID-19, it's obviously been a disaster. Now, I'm going to make sure I, I really emphasize here that I we're really not going to be talking about COVID a lot, so I'm just going to get rid of it out of the way right now. We'll do a quick little kind of chat about it right now and how it's affected the world of sports, but then we're going to get into some funny stories here with Dexter, and I'm glad that our friend Zach Torquato uh, got us acquainted, but overall, the world right now is in a dark place, and it's some troubling times, eh? Oh, for sure, yeah. It, uh, yeah, me and Torquato were over in Switzerland. It was kind of bad for... Uh about three weeks to a month before we finally left, uh, it started picking up here. We were, we were a little bit worried if we were going to get home. Um, but yeah, we got one of the last flights out of Switzerland, uh, coming back here over to Canada. And wow. there was like seven or eight hockey guys from all over Switzerland on the same flight as us. Uh, everyone trying to get back to Canada. So it was a pretty crazy scramble at the end there, but, uh, having to be home in Canada and, you know, say, be safe and stuff like that. And, you know, it was, uh, it was a little scary for a second over there. We weren't sure if we were going to get home or not. So I'm glad we did because this lockdown is, seems like it's going to go a little bit longer than we thought. Oh, definitely. Now, you know what? It's it's crazy. It's definitely insane. I must say, and I cannot say it enough, wash your hands. Stay home. And I want to say it this way, if I may. Stay the fuck home, okay? That's the way I, that's the way I want to put it. You know what I mean? Make sure, make sure you follow the rules. It's it, This can pass as long as we are good citizens. And you know what? We will weather the storm. And you know what? It's great. With this you know what we've had a lot of time to connect with family and friends and even for this show like everyone's like what do you talk about here on the game sports show? all the sports stuff locally nationally professionally everything of such well we get to have more interviews and we're very happy they're able to join us you know what i had a whole introduction kind of planned for you okay so i'm still going to go to that introduction and i'm going to say kind of a way all right i had alumnus of the bchl ncaa and university of michigan east coast hockey league and swiss league alumnus with the picton bees They'll shout out to the Picton Bees, University of Michigan, Idaho Steelheads, Manchester Monarchs, and Raps, Rapid City Rush, and the EHC Winterthur. I probably butchered that name, but you know what? That's fine. Heck, he is also a player who played in the Telus Cup and Midget and RBC Cup in junior with the v- Vernon Vipers, a team that I actually know quite well from my days playing junior hockey, and where he is tied in second in that tournament in scoring. 
I don't know if you remember that stat, but I found out that stat. Uh, so, Dexter, you know what? We have a lot to get to, and we're going to get to all your stories, and we're going to get rid of talking about the COVID-19 right now and get into the positive. So I want to sure. start off right now. As you said, you're in North Vancouver, and yeah. you got equated with Zach Turquado. So, obviously, a.k.a. Torx is what we like yeah. to call it, Torque. Uh, but you know what? I got to say in general, Turquato, I've known him since I was a wee lad. And any listeners that are not from Sault Ste. Marie that are listening, if you're in the United States, if you're in Europe, or if you're more in southern Canada, or if you're in the prairies, whatever you may be listening, that Zach Turquato was a very high-touted hockey player. And obviously, you know what? He's d- done very well for himself in the world of hockey. So he's definitely worth the YouTube look, the the Elite Prospects look. And I'm not going to lie. I got a lot of your stats, Dexter, from Elite Prospects. I'd be saying I'm, I must give a little bit of love to Elite, to Elite Prospects and also YouTube. I saw some of your post-game interviews, if you will, when you're in the Big Ten tournament. So I know you'd be obviously a great guest. But I want to get into some stories about Zach Turquato. Okay. <laughs> This could be PG or rated R. Well, you can go nuts here. I want to talk to you. <laughs> You're going to throw him right under the bus, eh? Oh, right under the bus. Right off the hop, I'm throwing him right under that bus because I know he's waiting for us to probably talk some smack about him or bring up some history. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, Torx is an awesome guy. Um, I, I came over to Switzerland like uh, two months ago, three months ago, right at the end of uh, January. And... Uh, you know, I was a little bit, I wasn't sure what to expect. It's my first time over in Europe. Um, two other guys, there's two other Canadian guys, but the rest of the guys were Swiss. Um, and the one guy was hurt. He was the reason I came over. And uh, Torx was the guy who wasn't hurt. And uh, both Torx and the other guy, Riley Brace, uh, were just awesome dudes. Um, from the second I got there, you know, they helped me out and stuff. You know, I think the, for my first or second night, they had me over for dinner. Um Torx and his girlfriend, uh, Caroline, you know, they're really good to me. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time with them. I spent, um, you know, basically every day off we had with them. Um, and in terms of uh, funny stories with Torx, um, I, I don't know if I had any uh, rated R stories, but he's just a good dude overall. He's uh, he's hilarious uh, when he's planning things, you know, setting everything up. He's got he's telling everyone how good it's going to be, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he usually delivers. So we, I think my second or third week we had a we had a national team break which is like a four or five day break and he took us to uh cortina italy which is in the dolomite mountains uh, area and uh he, he used to play there with brace so they went down it was uh me torx his uh, girlfriend caroline um and brace and his uh girlfriend and another buddy from the sioux um uh finner uh, i can't remember his first name kind of thing brett finley yeah brett finley sorry yeah uh and uh just had an awesome time there they showed us around you know we stayed at one of their old teammates hotels um checked out all the mountains and stuff it was an absolute blast so uh not a lot of bad stories about torx i got all good stories though awesome guy you know what one thing that you might be able to second especially since you were down there and spent a lot of time with them frankie palaziz was a goalie that we had on the show it was i can't remember now but it's recall within the past year it seems like this year is going by quicker and you know what maybe 2020 can end soon enough even though it's only just beginning of april because of covid 19 yeah. nonetheless frankie palaziz was on and he said that when he one distinct memory about turquado is his love for breakfast and getting up early <laughs> yeah he does get up early yeah 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 yeah, He's yeah a I, was guy, text, what's up? I was texting him this week uh about the quarantine stuff i've been sleeping in a little bit i've been getting up at like 9 30 10 and uh I was texting Torx, so what he been up to, blah, blah, blah. He goes, oh, man, I'm in bed at 10. I'm up at 7. I can't sleep. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> got nothing going on, man. No, not, that's the times with this. No, I could definitely see that with him. I guess Frankie was even saying how, you know what, he would stay in the room, right? He would close the door, and he would even pretend that he's sleeping just so he can let Guado clean the house and also maybe make breakfast for them. That's such a tricky move. You know what, I if I ever have to room with Terquato in any kind of way, shape, or form, you know what, I'm going to make sure I stay in bed because no hot, hot breakfast is going to be put on the table every morning. Oh, for sure. Yeah, he's not a bad cook, too. He cooked for me quite a bit. And I also know he loves his country music. Did that change at all? Man, he's more into, uh, he got me into, uh, like folk rock almost like the Lumineers, you know, and, uh, things like that. He's really into this, uh, band, uh, the Mighty Oaks. So, uh, they went, him and his girlfriend saw the Mighty Oaks play like three times in Switzerland. Um, and it's like more of a folk rock, you know, like kind of like low key, whatever. And he was blasting all the time. And I actually got into it too. That's what I listen to now when I cook and stuff. So. I might, have, 
Didn't hear I, a lot of country from him, to be honest with you. Oh, really? I might have to like v- venture over on the Spotify there once uh, this is uploaded for us to make sure I can check some of that out because obviously Switzerland has changed the lad over there, if you will. Now, would you, yeah, you're playing over there. Like, is it anything like playing here? And, and like, obviously, you played the university, you played in the East Coast, you've been around the states, and in a way, and you've seen that experience. The hockey, the 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 atmosphere, the type of hockey, everything is different over there. Is that fair to say? Oh man, it's it's uh, it's crazy how different it is. Uh, I mean, first off, you got the hockey. The ice is big. I think I think in each European league, it's different. So uh, like Torx could. Uh, talk more about the different leagues i've obviously just played in the swiss league so the the ice in the swiss league is is uh, big um and the players are skilled man they're different the way that they grew up like learning the game is a lot different than we uh grew up learning the game you know like we're used to you know we're used to the cycle you know like getting getting in the corners and stuff and battling and these guys are all like puck possession they're going they're not dumping the puck and there's no like you know very rarely did the puck get dumped in when i was there if, if the guys don't have anything, they're turning back. Like everyone's circling with speed. It's a cool way to play hockey, and I'm not surprised that a lot of European guys come over and you know dominate the NHL or wherever they play because I don't know, these guys are so good with the puck. Like we we didn't we never played with the puck that much when we were younger. You know, we're always taught dump it in when you get in trouble, blah blah blah. And these guys can just whip around, man. They got good skill, like. They are always like like slowing up, trying to find like a late guy, you know, as we're told, you know, kind of be more cautious. So it was uh, kind of an adjustment to start um, when I first got over there, especially coming from the East Coast League, which is a pretty physical league. There wasn't any physicality. Uh, you know, I think I got hit maybe one time in the seven or eight games I played over there. Um, okay. So, yeah, it's just a different way of playing. And it's really fun. You know, it's uh, it's uh, I wish that when we were younger, we learned uh we learned the game uh, the way they did, and then we came into the more physical part of the game. I mean, I love – my physicality is one of the uh, bigger parts of my game, but I wish I'd learned to skate and uh, play with the puck the way these guys, you know, grew up playing with the puck. So it's definitely a, an adjustment. And in terms of, uh, like, the non-hockey thing, just the way that everybody approaches things is a little bit different. Um, you know, guys, uh, they're – they're really focused on their bodies over there. And I think we're, we're, we're doing it now, but you'll see that all the, the Swedish and the Finnish guys that are coming over, they're all so strong and they're such good skaters. And I think the way that they train is different than the way that we train over here, especially when I was in, uh, at school in the States, you know, we're really bulking up. We're really like, you know, trying to get you know muscular and put on weight, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, none of these guys over here are in, Sw- are in Switzerland are jacked or anything like that, but they're, they're great athletes and they're really fast and they're, they got good uh, cardio and things like that. So just the way that they train is different too. So, yeah, it was definitely an adjustment um, going over there. But, you know, each game went by, I felt a little bit better. And it was nice to get, uh, you know, those games under my belt. I'd like to go back to Europe next year. So, See, yeah, it was a really cool experience. You know what they have? Like, and I, I'm going to refer to Letterkenny here a little bit, giving that love to shout yeah, yeah. out to a show that obviously doesn't sponsor us. They, they don't, it doesn't need an introduction in that yet. show. Uh, but not yet. And they, uh, at the end of the day, the, the way that, that one clip where they say four, like they said, four lines grinding, right? Four lines. I'm not going to finish the rest of that video because it's extremely not related to what we're discussing. But the, yeah. what I. Well, I couldn't agree more is in the youth side of hockey today, the hitting is, is later now. You're not, you don't learn to hit yeah. it. I believe it was novice that we learned or Adam around, around that kind of age. And then obviously now uh, the hitting is, is past peewee now. So the physicality of the game's behind where the game has evolved in that aspect where the physicality is out of it. The cycle isn't as much. And when you I couldn't agree more. They're trying to implement a lot of that European strategy into yeah. the North American game. But you know, Yes, it is an obvious comment that we are more built for physicality. That's why when you have yeah. Europeans come into North American game, they say, well, they might not be able to survive because they can't handle physicality. Sure, you know what? It's something that they're not used to, but they still succeed in today's National Hockey League or yeah, succeed in the European Elite Leagues or in the East Coast League, the HL, whatever league it may be, because the whole world of hockey is starting to come to that exciting aspect, the speed. Right. 
everything of such, right? And that's yeah. all you said. It, or you said it. You hit it right, hit the nail right on the head. You're taught at a young age previously it, with our with the generation of uh, yourself. You played at the higher level, obviously. Even to, uh, myself, just playing junior hockey, that you're just taught hit, finish your checks, hit, finish yeah. your checks, cycle puck. Uh, the puck possession, but in a way of battling in the corner. The puck possession in Europe is like you have the puck, your stick handling, you're using your hands, you're using your teammates. It's yeah. utilization of the players more, and that's where you know what. I, I agree with the European style hockey and people can call me crazy here in North America from Canada and the United States, but it's more exciting hockey now it seems. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, if you think back to like when I was growing up, like watching all the world junior games, all the tournaments like Canada would just blow these guys up and like every four check, they were just hammer these, like uh, these Europeans and the, we'd win and it would be like, Oh, that's the Canadian way of hockey. You know, that's how you win, blah, blah. blah. And even the, the LA Kings when they won, um, when they went on that whatever, how, how many how many cups they won in you know X amount of years, yeah. they uh, they were just bigger and like more physical than everyone. But now like there's so many young guys that are skilled. Like even when I go to the rink that I grew up on, uh, when I go down there and like if it's open hockey, man, these kids aren't playing like uh, shinny. They're like you know they're doing like mohawks through cones and they're doing like edge work that like I'd never even worked on before. You know, and like it's it's. Uh, it's the game is totally changing and it's uh, way more exciting to watch. I think, you know, so I think they, might, a- they might be able to like the, the youth hockey nowadays going into, well, I mean, youth hockey, sure. But I actually mean like the youth, like 18, 19, 20 year olds, the Alexis Lafreniere's that are coming up, etc. These yeah. guys are not um, as like, big bulky you know like i there's players that i've met and talked to like the henrik zetterberg's guys who are just in fit shape and uh, obviously you've got guys like alexis lafreniere now that's tall lanky he has size on him don't get me wrong the kid's big yeah. okay but he's not a guy that just works out at the gym like a football player by any means the no. the hockey the hockey nowadays it seems like people are like well it's harder on your body because of the explosiveness in your skating potentially i do i will not argue that but it's also better for you because before it's you're focused on weight 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 and you're bend you're like breaking your kneecaps like yeah. uh, literally speaking but the weight lifting that you were doing the deadlifts the squats everything that was done before it's not like that anymore it's swimming no, it's totally it's changing. it is it, which is positive because that's also more healthy for the human body for sure, yeah. No, I think uh, well in Vancouver, especially, it's been uh, pretty prevalent for uh, for the last five to ten years. They're kind of starting to realize it. I think in the NCAA, it's a little bit different. Uh, I think they're still uh, a little bit behind in terms of the training. I know when I was at school, we were doing a lot of you know heavy lifting and like a lot of track work and stuff. Um, I think even you know Michigan's starting to change too. All the schools are, but in Vancouver, we got. Um, uh, Fortius Institute and it's um, it's where a lot of the Canadian national athletes come train and I'm trying to think of the guy's name he, he just he works for Golden State now he actually was the guy who worked with Kevin Durant um, he was a Canucks guy forever uh, and he started this institute and basically it was uh, he trained all these trainers on how to uh, on the best way to train each uh, specific type of athlete for whatever sport they're doing and a lot of hockey players train there now it's in Burnaby BC um, I can't think of the guy's name. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's in Vancouver, it's, it's a big thing now. And I think, you know, it's starting to, to really change uh, all across North America. So trying to, I was trying to find it since we don't have producer ghosts. We like to call the individual that does the searching in the background. As we did project to do a video and audio today, but some def- technical difficulties as when you're doing a broadcast from the comforts of your own home, we weren't able to do that. So I was trying to search that when you're saying I couldn't quite locate it, but we'll see if I can locate it while we're talking. But even that, and that's, but to attest what you're saying, it's the way to go now. It, it is pre- being precautious with injury where before you get hit, like, and I'm not saying the way the 80s and 90s hockey were is different from thousands and even like the late, the earlier 10s. From the mid 10s to 20s, it's evolved hugely since the beginning of 2010. But you have like injuries are taken more seriously now. You get hit in the head, you don't get sent right back on the ice. You go through a protocol, you got, oh, you got a little slight kind of an issue, you're done. You're not playing the rest of the game. You're getting right, tested yeah. for your recovery which is so much better because you're looking out for the health because a lot of athletes when they hit 50, 60 that played before the past, unless you're Wayne Gretzky where he was protected by Marty McSorley the entire time, so he's right. in decent yeah. shape still. But at the end of the day, you have the, the hockey players now that are well protected. Or There's players that played before that really aren't. 
that, that, that aren't in the best physical shape because they're sore or they're back because of the way maybe programs where people are like, well, the game was tough. People don't look at what would happen off the ice at those times too. Is it, That's right. what does it too. It's not just on the ice. Yeah. Well, I think back then those guys were using training camp as a time to get in shape. You know, it's a little bit different now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I found that the guy's name is Rick Celebrini. Um, okay. yeah. yeah. So he started at Fortius Institute. Now he works as a director of sports medicine for the Golden State Warriors. So he was, uh, he handled, he used to do the Canucks and uh, he did all the national teams. I think he still does them in the summer when he has time, but uh, he's a big deal over here. So I think a lot of people follow him and a lot of people use uh, his methods for training. Definitely got to check them out. Listeners, viewers, ever may be watching, listening to the Game Sports Show, check out, check that out because, you know what, we need to get as much advice as we can. If you're an up-and-coming athlete or even a current athlete, definitely give that a check. I think you all also just got maybe you're put in your application to be a producer ghost for our show just by doing <laughs> that. You have quicker search fingers than I do with that. That is good. And there's one other thing that I want to say, not just by – your your name, okay? I have yeah. I have a thing that I have with my friends. Okay, we talk a lot all the time in terms of sports because that's what life is to a lot of people is sports. Yeah. The best names in sports. So you got Oscar Clefbaum. There's guys that are absolutely have fantastic names. Man, I gotta say Dexter Danks is definitely one of the best hockey names that I have <laughs> ever. Seen. Have you ever gotten that before? <laughs> yeah, I, I get it a lot. Yeah, I always the, see. Uh... Whenever I uh, join a team or whatever, it's uh, I get a tweet, something like that, you know? Oh, that's the best name. That, yeah. now, did you ever watch the show, Dexter? I must ask you that. Uh, I've seen a couple episodes. Uh, not much. I get that a lot, too. That more <laughs> than uh, the hockey name. I definitely. I, I think the, the, the name is one of the best. It's definitely, I'll say, top three for me, my friend. And I don't remember the third, so don't ask me what the other one is. But nonetheless, we're going to transition now. Okay, we're going to, you've talked about the jump over from North American sports where you played in the BCHL, NCAA, and then the East Coast over to Europe. But I want to rewind a little bit. So a bit of backtracking and go back to the NCAA life. Okay, now. Sure. Obviously, everyone wants to hear the stories. Everyone wants to hear the, the, the good stuff about when they were away at school, et cetera. And we'll, we'll try to get that idea, a little bit of things like that with how yeah. life was in Michigan. But you had a time, okay, in Michigan. Now, in light of this uh, quarantine, this is an opportunity for many of us to be able to look into the past, I like to say, right? And in terms right. of memories and stories and you remember things or if you're going out for a run or just trying to keep active and if you're listening to us right now while you're going for a run if we motivate you to go for a run that's great and all but make sure that you remember reflect on all the good fun times and this is what this quarantine has done so i want you to do that so let's get started with the tales of dexter we're going to call this okay uh so our mutual friend zach terquato uh said obviously you had quite a time at the university of michigan that's the exact words that he used on instagram that's just so you know, heck, you even, you, get, you, heck, you even played with Zach Hyman, Dylan Larkin, Andrew Kropp, Zach Rosinski, Kyle Connor, Tyler Mott, and just obviously, maybe people do not know this one. And last but certainly not least, Quinn Hughes. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong because you played with Quinn Hughes, right? Yeah, he uh, was a freshman when I was a senior. Yeah, potential future James Norris winner, Quinn Hughes. I'm going to say flat out right now. So, sure. you know what? Is there with those guys in particular the experiences because obviously they're different ages Zach Hyman's been with the Leafs for quite some time Larkin mm -hmm. has been with the Wings he's obviously going from Michigan over to the Wings is big obviously he's really watched in Michigan uh, one yeah. of the fastest players on on the ice right now in the National Hockey League he still is you know Connor McDavid I think is the fastest player I still think he is in the world but with the puck guaranteed Connor McDavid's the fastest in, in the world in my opinion but yeah. over playing with these guys any stories with these guys or have you ever did you when you first walked into that room with the University of Michigan did you go shit do you know was there, am I going to get the paddle is there any initiation is this still a thing or or were you was it basically just a tight-knit group from the start because I know you guys had some decent success I believe you also unfortunately lost in the Big Ten championship in 2015 I think yeah that would have been so I think we lost in the Big Ten championship game my first year mm -hmm. And then my second year, we uh, we won it. Yep. And then my third year, we lost. And then my fourth year, we lost in the semifinals, but we ended up going to the Frozen Four. That's so my right. first my first year, uh, yeah. Well, my first year when I was coming in as a freshman, so Larkin and Varensky were both in my class. 
So mm-hmm. they were they were coming in and they immediately became the two best players on the team. So uh, that was nice to come in with them. Um, but yeah, when I I mean coming from the BC, I, I don't know if uh, we had maybe you know six guys go on to NCAA schools, maybe more than that, maybe closer to eight or ten. But um, so when I walked in that locker room with Artie, you know, like there was five, four or five first and second round picks. It was uh, obviously a little bit different than my uh, my dressing room in Vernon. So it was an adjustment for sure, um, especially with the guys and the the third or fourth year guys who were leaving right after the year, you know, uh, who knew they were leaving and stuff. We had such a stacked team for my first two years. Like I think there was eight to 10 NHLers on my, that I played with in my first two years. Uh, we had such good talent, but we just never, uh, we couldn't win. Like we were... We, were, we would always have winning records, but we'd never, uh, like, win the one game we needed to, you know? And um, and I think uh, a lot of that, like, came down to um, the way the NCAA is, like, kind of changing. So the NCAA now is, uh, you know, it's not – the big schools aren't dominating like they used to. Like, smaller schools are starting to win, and they're starting to, um, you know, do well in the tournament against the bigger schools. And I think the, the one-and-dones in the NCAA that, you know, we had – uh, Larkin was the one and done and we lost Hyman after the year, blah, blah, blah. And all the teams that are winning now are older teams that are like, uh, like Quinnipiac brings in older guys and they're around 23, 24 and they win. And, you know, even like smaller schools like Clarkson, they're bringing in older guys and winning. And we were like, it was kind of right at the turning point. I think maybe started a couple of years prior because Michigan had dominated for yep. like 20, 20 years. They, they were in the turn of, sorry. Pistol. Historic. That 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 school is historic. It's a yeah. it's one of the better schools to go to in NCAA. Yeah. So uh, so Red Berenson is a coach there, and uh, I mean I don't think he missed the tournament for twenty something years. Some and they like they dominated. They went to the Frozen Four. Like I don't know how many times. Um, and I, when I got there, they're in the middle of a uh, uh, two year hiatus. They hadn't made the tournament in two years. And that was the first time in 20 years that they hadn't made it. So it was kind of uh, like the I would the the program obviously wasn't in scramble mode or anything like that, but it was just like uh, the, everyone wasn't happy with how the program was performing. So uh, there was a lot of uh, pressure to win, and um, we didn't. I mean, we were winning obviously, and we were doing well, but we didn't make the tournament that first year. So that was a lot of like. Uh, like big pressure in the program because the next year we were bringing in Kyle Connor, who's supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, one of the best players in the, in the country. And he ended up leading the nation in scoring. Um, so Very that was in Winnipeg right now. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's like a 35, yeah. 40, 40 goal scorer in Winnipeg. Now he's dominant. not a big, not a big yeah. deal. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. He played on a, that year. He played on a line with uh, Tyler Mott and JT Coffer. And I think, they were uh, one, two, three in scoring in the nation, and four, five, and six was uh, North Dakota's first line, which was uh, Kajula, Nick Schmaltz, and uh, Brock Besser. Oh, so another good name, Brock Besser in hockey, must say. Yeah, unreal. Oh, you should have seen the. We played them in the uh, NCAA tournament that year. We lost to them. Yeah, and, and that our first line probably played 30 minutes and their first line played 30 minutes and they just played against each other. It was one of the coolest things I've ever watched. I was just sitting there on the bench watching these guys play against each other. It was so fast. It was, it was, it was six. Part of. Did he still have a good flow, Brock Besser? (laughs) Did he still have the good hair when he played university? Yeah, he looked great, you know, long blonde flow. He looked awesome. (laughs) Looks top. You know? Yeah, I think he still has the best hair. Definitely not Willie Nylander, I'll tell you right now. That, but we get into that. But nonetheless, you know, you have this experience playing with these guys. They obviously, when they're in the locker room, do they get – when they walked in, when they have that expectation. Like, for example, Kyle Connor. There's a guy that walks in. Did he have that immediate respect as soon as he walked in that room? I'm not saying that no one's disrespectful or anything, but I'll be straight out. That in the, in the world of hockey, when you play with your team, you build respect. You build chemistry with your friends. You don't just walk in and say, hey, I'm the, one of the best players in the country and you must respect me. It ain't like that like it is in the movies and the Disney movies or anything like that. Nonetheless, right. the, the, like these guys, Larkins, the, uh, the Kyle Connors, these, even Quinn Hughes, I'm sure when he came up, maybe it 
I heard when he first started playing university, he was highly touted, but it wasn't the expectation of, let's say, maybe Kyle Connor had when he first came in. So when Kyle came in, was it just like, all right, this guy had that immediate respect? Or do you know what? Did he come in and you know what? He was kind of nervous. He was a he was a young guy coming into a locker room with high expectations. What did, what was his body language? Uh, well, he's an incredibly hard worker, so he just came in uh, and worked hard. But I mean, to your point, uh, no, you, it's it's hard uh, entering a an NCAA team because you're you're basically just joining a team that's already um, that's already been playing together for uh, one, two, three years. You know, so it's not like you can just walk in and be, let's say, you know, I'm the man and stuff. You got to earn it, obviously. And uh, so, funny story about Kyle Connor when he came in. Uh, I mean, you could see it right away. He was going to dominate. He's sick. Uh, he could score anything. I've never yeah. seen someone score goals like him. He can score from anywhere. He doesn't have like a super hard shot. He can just, he just like knows where to shoot through defensemen, through goalies and stuff. It's incredible. But uh, so he came in and I think uh, they, they were selecting the world junior team. Um, like they probably selected eight to 10 games into the season and he was doing pretty good. Um he wasn't near the top of the NCAA scoring or anything, but he was, you know, up there. Yep. And they snubbed him from the team. And uh, and I think some of that had to do with uh, the way USI, USA Hockey works. I think he wasn't part of the National Development Program, so I don't think they liked that. He declined yep. to play for the National Development Program. I think uh, players take different direction to go places. You know, it's hard to uh, hold sure. to somebody. But that sounds right. Would you? They like to, let's say, look good on the programs, if you will. In the special yeah. Instance. Well... I, I think the national development program is a great idea, but uh, I mean, they got, you know, they'll probably have four or five first round forwards each year, you know, give or take. And uh, for him, he just wanted to go to the different USHL team and be the man um, and uh, develop, you know, which he did. You know, I think he led the league in scoring for two years or something like that. Um, but so he came in, he got snubbed. Right. And uh, we had a couple other guys from the team go and play in that. I think Wierenski went and, maybe someone else. And so the next game we're playing and we're missing, you know, a couple guys to the world juniors. And, and I think Kyle Connor, if I remember correctly, puts up back to back hat tricks uh, <laughs> on Saturday or Friday, Saturday, and like the GLI tournament, you know, that tournament and uh, the greater lakes invitational. Oh, that's it's, right. Yes. I think actually Lake state won that last year. Did they I, win last year? I believe they won that last year. I'll have to pull that up to make sure I get my facts right. But nonetheless, yes, familiar with that for sure. You're talking about? Sorry? You're talking about this year? Uh, no, this past year. Uh, no, not yeah, this yeah, year. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who won. I can't remember the top of my head this year. I'll have to look and see if I can pop up their schedule. It was last season that uh, Lake Superior uh, State University Lakers won it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Connor went on like an, after that. He went back-to-back hat tricks won MVP of the tournament, and he went on an absolute tear after that. You know, he led the nation in goals, points. He's just like a big fuck you to USA Hockey. It was, uh, it was pretty cool. <laughs> you did, but, honestly, yeah, he's actually like, been getting snubbed. He's been getting snubbed. His, uh, he got snubbed from the All-Star game uh, this year, too. It's pretty funny. Uh, it seems like it's starting to run up into his uh, – not really in his favor. So here, here's – okay, here we go. I got the statistic for the Great Lakes Invitational. Had to make sure I was right, okay? I don't like be, – I, I don't mind getting proved wrong. I have numerous times, especially when it comes to pronouncing names. But nonetheless, the Sunday it was on – um, it was on in December. So December 30th and 31st, this was 2018. Uh, right. Lake Superior State University played against Michigan State, won 4-3 in overtime in the 54th annual Great Lakes Invitational. And then Michigan Tech, they played uh, in that last game. It was the the final. That's what it says here. They played against Michigan Tech, and they won it 6-3 to three in that game. So Lake State did win it in 2018-2019 year. Uh, this season, I know Lake State – uh, when they, they did participate in different carnival games, but in terms of December when they played, it was called actually the TD Bank Catamount Cup in the end of December. So I was unsure if that was maybe a connected or if it changed or whatnot, if it was a different tournament, but they obviously didn't have the same success as they lost. They lost out and didn't get anywhere. They just lost out in the round robin there. So that's, uh, that's definitely a tournament that's known here. And yeah. A lot of scouts definitely attend these. So with Kyle Connor putting up those numbers, I'm sure the Winnipeg Jets were in full attendance. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I think everyone was in full attendance to watch it. Man, he was he was incredible that one year that he was with us. He uh, 
there was a, a span where he scored every game for, I think, like 10 or 12 games in a row. Him and his, I think he had 35 around there. And then his uh, line mate, Maude, had like 30. And then Comfort was a centerman, you know. He's just, it was a, it was a crazy line. Like they, they scored at least two every game for the entire season. And we were, I think that year, my sophomore year, I think we broke uh, the NCAA record for goals per game. It's something I think we we're averaging like five and a half, six goals a game. Uh, giving up, giving up like four and a half, five. So it was, uh, it was a funny year. So now you obviously we're talking about Kyle, but we have you on here too. So going with you, being in practice against these guys, the Kyle Connors, the mm-hmm. Dylan Larkins. You know what? If I was against Dylan Larkin in practice, not like I would challenge him in a like in a in a race, I'd lose, a hundred percent. I already know I'd lose. You know, yeah. I think. My- my speed that I still only, or my uh, strength in hockey was only ever my, really my skating and speed. But you know that that I I feel like practice is a place where you can have fun with the guys, right? Where you'd be like when Lark you could, with Larkins in the corner, you battle him, try to chase him back and forth. Hyman, there's a guy that has perfected his role in Toronto. Okay, yeah. that. Oh, yeah. he, he is fitting in nicely. Doesn't matter if he plays with Marner Matthews or Nylander Matthews or Tavares Marner or whoever he plays with and his PK. And he also runs the show when there's an empty net. Okay. Was yeah. like, he loves scoring on the empty nets. Okay. Yeah. So, like when you're against these guys in practice though, they must give you that competitive edge where it's like, Hey, I want to, I want to compete. I want to, I want to take the puck away from these guys. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. It's obviously you're, great hockey player yourself but when you're going against uh, these guys that have those expectations you want to step in and be in the, in the light with them or you know maybe absorb some of their talents because when you play in practice with your teammates you can absorb some habits and also even get better playing with players that are a different kind of player than you are yeah for sure you know uh especially with guys who uh you know are only expecting to be in the ncaa for one or two years like those guys go hard man and we pre- we only played 35 35- you know, to 40 games a year. So practices were uh, intense for us, especially Monday, Tuesday. So we'd have a lot of battles and stuff. And, you know, we got that year, especially actually my sophomore year, I remember there was a couple practice fights, you know, and we had uh, like a confer and mod or really intense in practice. So it kind of set the tone. The confer was the captain that year. So yeah, we had some battles and stuff, you know, as for Larks, uh, one of the hardest working guys I know, um, in hockey he was always the last one on the ice um and uh so he used to go hard and stuff and you know nobody backed down it was a really really fun year and um you know it sucks the way it ended the way it did we lost to north dakota i think we, we should have uh had a chance to play for the national championship but yeah man th- those uh in the ncaa with only 40 games like you're practicing you practice in monday to thursday hard especially monday to wednesday so we're doing a lot of game situation stuff and guys are you know no one's uh, holding back on hits because there's, there's like uh, five or six guys who are out of the lineup uh, every weekend, and you only have the practice to show how good you are. So those guys are going hard too. So it's uh, it's definitely a lot more intense than practice are in pro now. Um, you know, you don't have 70, 80 games to showcase yourself. You have to showcase yourself in practice if you're a guy who's not playing that much. So it gets really intense, yeah. Definitely does. This is the Game Sports Show. Dave McKaig. I'm here joined by Dexter Danks with uh, all the way from North Vancouver. You know, and you know what? Obviously here we have a lot of time uh, to talk and do interviews. So we're going to have plenty of interviews here on the Game Sports Show. It's funny. Earlier you brought up uh, Riley Brace and we're going to have Riley on actually next week on Tuesday. So right. we have to make, sure, have to make sure to bring that up uh, on Tuesday that we uh, had you on and see if we get some stories that you haven't told us about yourself. <laughs> maybe next year. You know, nonetheless, but you know what? You're being in the locker room with these guys, you know, and being at the university life. Okay. Now there's traditions at, at the university of Michigan. Now I just know of people that know of people. Okay. I feel like, I'm, I feel like Saul Goodman uh, saying that off breaking bad. Okay. Taking a quote from there, pretending that I know people that I don't, but there's traditions there like kissing under the engineering arc. Okay. Uh, kissing I under the engineering yeah, so according to Falkert, this is off an article with tourthe10.com. Uh, this is where the link was sent to me, so you can confirm this or not. A student is not a true co-ed until he or she has been kissed under the engine arc uh, at midnight. This tradition dates back to the time when men lived on Central Campus. So yeah. that, 
that's a quick thing. So that is a th- when you're at university, there's traditions, there's parties like that. So I the the life at the University of Michigan, obviously playing, obviously the football stadium. Okay, one of the nicest, most historic places. And you have you've had Detroit, uh, the Red Wings play the Maple Leafs there outside. So obviously, University of Michigan is a well as a well. Uh, named university in all the United States. So is that tradition true? Okay. And if it is, if, if you never heard about it, that's fine. I don't know if I'll believe you, but it, it, did you do this tradition? Okay. Number one. And number two, you know, just the overall vibe being at the university life when you're a hockey player. Now, I don't mean this in any kind of conceited way or, or you to kind of brag about being a hockey player, but when you're an athlete at a school, okay, that is a, that is a great boost for yourself. You know, you worked hard to get to that point and you've accomplished a lot playing there and you're able to complete education while you do it. It just must've been a great feeling being able to do that i actually admire the ncaa route more than the ohl whl and the qmjhl route to be straight on honest that's no offense to the chl by any means okay there's a lot of players that come out of there that you got mcdavid you got lafreniere coming up right now I, Tavares, the players that have come out of there like the, the list goes on and on and on even wayne gretzky played there okay in the 70s so nonetheless the ncaa route you, you're able to get an education you're able to play hockey and develop memories like that. So overall, that experience at, at, at University of Michigan, how you felt about yourself and this tradition, tell me about it. <laughs> uh, well, first off, I've actually never heard of that uh, tradition, if I'm being honest. The, cool. uh, the engineering buildings are like on North Campus, which is about like a 15-minute drive, okay. uh, 10, 15-minute drive from where Central Campus is. So I think maybe when uh, the engineering uh, was uh, – or when they had the engineering buildings like close to campus, I think maybe that's when it was, but I've never heard of it to be honest with you. But, uh, as for a whole, my university experience, it was, uh, it was incredible, man. It was, uh, you know, when I was younger, I, I, we were a big, uh, we were big Vancouver giants fans. So I had season tickets to the Vancouver giants. Uh, I live like 10 minutes away from the Pacific Coliseum. Um, and they drafted me, uh, in the, um, the Bantam draft, whatever. And, you know, it was like the best day of my life. You know, I was going to be a Vancouver giant, blah, 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 you know. And when I was 16, um, I was playing uh, or when I was 15, I was playing uh, midget in uh, Vancouver and the Giants uh, approached me about signing and I really wanted to sign, blah, blah, blah. You know, they gave me a couple sticks. I thought it was the coolest thing ever, you know, and I had the contract and my dad wouldn't let me sign it. And, uh. I remember that I didn't talk to him for like two weeks. You know, he said, well, let's just wait. Let's just see, you know, you're not going to play on the Giants next year. Let's just see uh, if the NCAA is an option, blah, blah. I still remember vividly, like, I didn't even talk to him for, you know, two weeks. And then. Rattled. You were not rattled. (laughs) Oh, so rattled, man. It was like, uh, oh, every Friday night we went to the Giants game. I thought those guys were like, uh, you know, superheroes, honestly. Yeah. And uh, and, uh, so then I went. And I t- or Penticton talked to me, and um, they said, "Hey, we want you to come up to the interior, blah blah blah, play on the junior B team, and then play games with us that year." And my dad said, "Okay, do this, and then see uh, what we'll see how after the season if you still want to go play for the Giants, blah blah blah." And I think like three months later, I committed to Michigan. Um, we went down there, me and my dad, and we went down there, and I went, "Oh, this is this sh- this should be pretty cool." Uh, I'd like to do this. And then so when I got there, man, it was like a totally different world. I mean, first off, living in the States is a lot different. The people are different in the States for sure um, than, Can- than Canadians. Um, and, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. I hadn't been to school for a year because I was one year removed. Um, but the, the, everything they do for you to make it so easy, the schooling, you know, well, not so easy. It was actually kind of a grind sometimes, but they help you a lot. Um, and the campus life uh was awesome man it was like you i was just living it was like i was living with my four best buddies in fantasy land for four years uh we season was pretty dialed in you know we played uh friday saturday we practiced hard all week saturday nights we had fun at the at the we went to the same bar every saturday for four years um but just uh it was way more than I thought it was going to be. Had I known anything about what it was going to be, I wouldn't even have thought about playing in the uh, 
in the CHL, you know. And I think uh, a lot of guys are starting to realize that now because, you know, more guys from Western Canada and Ontario and things like even the uh, Prairie provinces are starting to head down there and guys are coming back and they absolutely love it. Like, I don't know a lot of guys that have gone down to the NCAA that have hated it. You know, maybe a couple guys <clears throat> in some smaller programs that weren't playing a lot. But, I mean, we had guys – that were that were you know touted that were supposed to be big players but didn't play that much in Michigan and you know they never even thought about leaving so it uh, it was incredible I mean is there anything in, in particular you want to know yeah. about my experience uh, Yeah, essentially like the the educational that must have been most attractive to you too right to be able to complete an education not that you can't do that when you play at, yeah. at the CHL by any means but I believe. And I, I'm saying this by not knowing 100%, despite that being well connected with the junior ranks, but that the education is, let's say, a little bit more focused when you're playing for that school, correct? Like, like uh, maybe it's obviously not playing like in the CHL, like the obviously made programs are getting a little bit more strict, but being able to play at the NCAA level, you must have to achieve a specific, uh, uh, specific GPA uh, to be able to continue to play or, or is that even, was that even, is that a rumor? Yeah, no, no, that's true. You have to uh, achieve like a 1.9 through, through your first two years and then a 2.0, I think, for your last two years. It's not um, – I mean, if you go to class and do the work, it's not hard. You know, you can uh, – the schooling, they, they, they get, there's so many different things they have set up for you. I mean, you can get a tutor for any class whenever you want. Uh, we have a brand-new uh, facility. Like uh, Stephen M. Ross is his name. He donated $100 million to the uh, athletic – um, program he built this brand new facility for us um so basically how our day would work is we would go to class in the morning from whenever you had class from 8 30 to you know 1 30 whenever your classes would be and then you, we practiced at 3 30 and then after practice they would give us a meal and then we would head over to the academic center where, where you could have tutors do your homework blah blah, blah whatever and it was the way it's set up is it's hard to fail um unless you just don't want to do the work, you know, if you don't do the work, then you're not going to do well sort of thing. But, you know, I was uh, an okay student growing up. Um, but the, the, all the different uh, resources they have for you as a student is uh, incredible. Like it's, it's, uh, if you're really struggling in something, they can have someone one-on-one with you in, in an hour if you want, you know, so in whatever class they had tutors for every single class that we had. So, um, they help a lot. Um, the, the, there's a lot of money in the uh, Michigan football program, you know, so they have they put a lot of money into uh, making sure those guys are uh, eligible and it kind of trickles down to the rest of the sports as well. See, that's the, the main thing. I know we are going a little bit above time that we committed with you. So, you know, it, it's I'm, I admire the NCAA. Right? I got friends like uh, Brett Perlini, obviously, that have went to that school out. And there's more friends of mine, Kyle Jean. There's some friends uh, that played that and that they even life after hockey, they, they, they went pretty f- pretty far in hockey you know they play the east coast or they've been drafted etc but when they were unable to or they just stopped playing because even though they had options maybe go play overseas uh, mm-hmm. they just decided to get to another part of their life and that right. is a big thing that the world this might be a downer to say right now but i really strongly believe in that scholastic value that what sports teams can offer because i think that's yeah. important to do like there's there's not every day a LeBron James. I know that's basketball, but that, or even uh, maybe I will, I'll just refer right to hockey. There's not a Connor McDavid every day. There's not a Sidney Crosby every day, right? There's not those type of players. You got to work hard to get it. And I, I believe fully that Crosby and McDavid are natural talent. Okay. Uh, Because I can tell you this from a friend of mine, Tyler Kennedy, that even to knows as well as Crosby's legs are as big as tree trunks. Okay. And I'm sure you played with multiple guys that are just built fit. Like they're built hockey players and, they right. work to do that but obviously the exceptional status of players like the mcdavids and the crosbys that they don't come around every day so if that doesn't work out or even crosby has scares with concussions right like right. if he like eric lindros look what happened to him okay so he, scott stevens has his elbow or his shoulder or whatever you want to call it tattooed on his face basically okay for the entirety of his career and and 
not saying that Lindros wasn't intelligent, nothing worked out after, everything worked out fine after, but maybe if you're a player that isn't at that exceptional status where you're making the 10, the 8, the 7 million dollars, you're only making league minimum at a after coming out of playing junior or even just a free agent from overseas, whatever it may be, that you know, if you get hurt, that education might not be available. You might not be, what, what's there to do after, right? right. And obviously, having that factor of education, I think it should be more strict here on the Canadian side. Not saying that it isn't, because I'm not in depth with every program that plays, but I know that the, the more so of the regional teams in this area in the Ontario Hockey League, I'm not going to say any names and know it's not the Greyhounds, just so everyone knows. I know Greyhounds, we are affiliated with the Greyhounds here on the Game Sports Show, so I'm making sure I stress that. I'm not talking hounds. Oh, but, nice. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a big part of the program that here in the Sioux that they go to Algoma University or that they do online school, whatever it may be. I, but I also know there's some teams down south in Ontario that are just starting to implement that program. And I have kudos to that because yourself being able to put on your hard hat and after not being able to play with Vancouver, you went the NCAA, NCAA route and were able to finish your school. And now you're still playing hockey though, which is great, but you mm-hmm. did do education as well. Yeah. So it's nice. Uh, it's, when I was 16, I obviously wasn't thinking about it that way. Uh, my parents were, but, um, you know, now that I, I've got it and I realize, I mean, now even like, you know, I was playing in the East Coast League and there's guys who are 30 and they're not really sure what they're going to do after, you know, they don't have any degree or they're not sure what their interests are, blah, blah, blah. And man, that would be scary, you know, like finishing off your career at 30. And then, I mean, everything you've known is hockey your whole life. You, you don't really have any other skills. Um or any skills, you know, that, uh, uh, that you've learned in a classroom sort of thing. It's, uh, like I've talked to you guys, man, it's scary, you know? So it's, uh, it's nice that I got it over with while I was playing hockey. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm really thankful that my dad didn't let me sign that contract. <laughs> Everything works out. Now, a couple last things before we let you go. You played at the Joel Lewis arena yeah. obviously how is that experience obviously that that the arena the arena the nostalgia of that arena everything obviously now it's little caesars which yeah. you know, <laughs> isn't the same you know everyone likes to keep the joel lewis name if you will but hey right. modern hockey, it's a business the joel lewis how was that experience to play at a rink of such let's say value with a very historic franchise that uh was able to be the home of the red wings for so many years yeah the joe's sick uh I got a funny story about our first game. So our first game, we were playing Michigan State there. I'll make it quick. Uh, and Take your time. and um, so it's uh, they do it every year. It's called the Duel in the D. Michigan plays Michigan State. They usually pack it. It's a big game, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so we ended up – someone fucked up, and we left late for the game. We didn't factor in the traffic down. It's like a 35, 40-minute drive down there, but there was traffic. So we ended up showing up like 35 minutes before warm-up. And this was uh, going to be uh, Dylan Larkin's first game in the Joe uh, oh. a- after he was drafted. So we got there like 35 minutes before warm-up, and everyone's, you know, all our meetings are fucked. We're not doing anything, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's hurrying up, trying to warm up, do their, like, routine, blah, blah, blah. And we ended up getting out to warm-up a couple minutes late, too. We're going around, and everyone's, like, you know, not really settled in. And the place is packed. And everyone's wearing Larkin jerseys. Everyone's chanting his name, blah, blah, because, you know, he just got drafted, whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. Of course. Let me go, uh, 15 or something. And uh, and so we step out there, and he scores, like, I don't know, seven minutes into the game. And it was the loudest I'd ever heard in the arena. It was sick. Everyone was cheering, like, you know, the chants going for his name. It was a really cool thing. See, that, and that's – there's a guy that from Michigan that's, that's, that's Detroit. Detroit, it's all – he was watched right under that microscope. When he was drafted, I remember yeah. watching that draft and the, the expectation uh, just from the Detroit side and having some analysts here on the show. Uh, that We were just starting our show, and Dylan Larkin, when he was drafted, the hype was just huge, huge, huge. Yeah. Uh, and potentially a – you know, <laughs> like I said, the, the arguably still the, one of the fastest guys in the league, if not the fastest. So there's there's a guy that I believe has lived up to the hype. And right True. now, Detroit and overall, that, that city, they take pride in their college hockey. And I can just imagine that feel. You must have just had goosebumps, right? Even every time stepping on the ice before you played, playing at that high level, you're probably like, wow, 
you know what, like, look where I'm at. And having that packed arena, everyone just chanting Larkin, just imagine how he felt. Oh, man, incredible, yeah. Yeah, the show was cool. It had a lot of character. I think we got two years uh, to play at it. Um, but the new facility at Little Caesars is, oh, it's awesome. They oh, got, like, uh, obviously they're sharing with the Pistons now, and they got, like, the setup for each team. The locker room is probably one of the best in the NHL. Like, and it's cool. They change it uh, when the Pistons are playing or the uh, Red Wings are playing. They change everything in the arena around. It's cool. Really? Like, it's all electronic, too, or is it all manually well, done? I feel like they do it, but even, like, in the hallways. So, like, when you're at a Red Wings game in the hallways or the quarters, whatever, it's all Red Wings stuff. But then when you go to a Pistons game, it's all Pistons stuff. So it's uh, – I don't know how they do that exactly. I think maybe they have uh, different wallpaper and stuff, but the the facilities that those guys have, like down below, is uh, top notch. Top notch in North America, yeah. Now the two final questions, are kind of like last question before I let you go. Uh, as like I mentioned, we went a little bit over time, but it's what happens when you get in some good conversation. So first question is, what is the plan for next year and forward for? Dexter, and like I said, we're calling this episode of the Game Sports Show the Tales of Dexter. I think I like, I'm going to let that stick. So that's the first question. Second one is, in this quarantine that's currently going on, a lot of things on social media is what to watch on Netflix or play in shelf. For example, the Game Sports Show has an EASHL team uh, that we play when we can want to kill time. Uh, obviously, myself still working at my full-time job at the hospital. Uh, it's, a, it's a real big zoo in the world, fully. And oh, what yeah. do you do on your quarantine or what are you watching on netflix give give the listeners and viewers maybe some suggestions to watch or what you do on your free time those are my two questions before i let you go uh well it's been uh so this is my first time home uh for an extended period of time in like six years like since i left for college so it's been a little different i got my two brothers back my sister's still away at school but uh so we've just been hanging out with each other spent a lot of time uh, with the family you know i've been cooking a little bit uh I'm trying to get into that, you know, in Switzerland, everything was so expensive. So I had to learn how to cook. I wasn't super good at it. So, uh, trying to, uh, get my dad to teach me a little bit. Um, but no, I watching a couple of Netflix show. I, uh, downloaded the new call of duty, been playing with a couple of buddies, you know, trying to socialize a little bit, but, uh, not an awful lot, honestly, uh, watching succession on HBO right now. It's a really good show. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, Viewers, check that out. I got to check out uh, Tiger King. I'm hearing a lot of buzz about it. Uh, oh, the buzz is unbelievable. <laughs> no, I haven't. I, I have a plan to watch it this weekend because other than that, other uh, than sitting on my ass and maybe yeah. trying to be a little bit active in my day, that is on my agenda. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, is, that is on the agenda. And I'm hearing mixed things. I'm about hearing mixed things too, so I got to get my own opinion. Definitely comment below listeners and viewers about so maybe me and Dexter have a little bit of, you know, kind of expectations going in. But hockey next year, that is the plan going forward. You're just taking it right now, day by day right now, and just letting it see how it works out. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm planning to play another year. Um, I'm in the process of getting my Hungarian passport right now, actually. So um, hopefully that'll come through in the, in the coming months. Uh, I'm planning to play in, in Hungary next year um, in the Austrian League, the Ebel the EBEL. Um, so we'll see what happens. I, I really want to uh, do that and then maybe have a chance to play for the Hungarian national team um, before, uh, before I finish up my career. I'm not, I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to play for, so we'll see. But uh, yeah, right now the plan is to go to Hungary next year. Definitely. That's fantastic. And Dexter, I won't keep you too much longer, my friend. You know, I'm glad they're able to get acquainted. And as I mentioned, we did aim for a half hour, but our old kind of cliche on the show is we aim for a half hour, but it's always double that. And <laughs> the expectation yeah. has uh, not seen. You should see this when we're live. It's great when we're pre recording. We can just free for all goal when it's live. We're scrambling. <laughs> right. yeah. We're usually scrambling, you know, but it's great they're able to have the time to discuss. And I'm glad Torque got us connected. And my plan is, I was kind of putting this into Turquado's year was that it'd be great after we have Riley on on Tuesday we have Zach coming on in the coming weeks as well potentially down the road maybe leading into the summer that all three of like yourself Riley and Zach we can get you all on the same feed once everything's back to normal we're in studio and that yeah. we can have us four kind of do a whole segment together so we can have some good little storytelling between each other going on and even yeah, potentially fun. it'd be great to arrange that so we'll definitely keep in touch and again I want to yeah. say thank you for coming on the show yeah, thanks a lot. I'm planning to make my first uh, trip to the Sioux this summer. Told Torx I'd come visit him. So, oh, okay. So, there we go. 
we, yeah. we have a setup. We have a setup where we're going to be doing stuff outside this summer. So we're going to have there some couch right on the beach a little bit. Or right, in, right, uh, right outside, we'll enjoy some brews like I've been during this entire interview. Uh, and you know what? We'll sit down and have something really live right there and right in front of uh, the water here in the Sioux. It's definitely very scenic here in Sioux St. Marie. You'll definitely enjoy it if you can make it uh, up. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. I can't wait. Definitely. Hopefully you're able to do that. We'll get connected hopefully in the very near future. Again, that's been uh, Dexter Danks with us here on the Game Sports Show. And I want to give a special shout out. This is the Game Sports Show special edition. Obviously, everybody knows it's been kind of uh, very sporadic with our schedule. There's been a lot of uploads despite being in quarantine, self-quarantine, isolation, whatever you want to call it. Scott Nason, Butch Davis. And also myself, Scott, we've had shows get uploaded. So you can check out our website, Spotify, Apple, Podbean, Facebook, and Instagram for those shows. As well as make sure you keep it locked. Like, follow, subscribe here on the game because the schedule will continue to be sporadic. Instead of doing our four shows normally a week from Monday to Thursday, those have been postponed on the schedule. And as I mentioned, it will be sporadic until this is all uplifted. So I want to make sure I remind everyone to make sure to just keep an eye on the Game Sports Show post for special editions much like this with the tales of Dexter. And I want to give a special shout out to Sports Center Bar and Grill, North Superior Brewing Company on TV, ESPN, ESPN 400 Sovereign Communications, North Shore Sports and Auto, Compass Imaging Group, Demansky Office Interiors, Northern Critters in Need, and Thrush Creative. If you'd like to be a sponsor on the show, don't hesitate to reach out to yours truly. And a special shout out again to Compass and Demansky. They're still doing office delivery, etc. So make sure you support local. To the restaurants that are still open or doing takeout uh, while that's still going on. Make sure you take advantage of that. Also, with the businesses that are operating, support the local. Support, support, support. Everything here in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario in particular, we're a smaller community in comparison to some bigger cities of 75,000 people here. we got to make sure we have our local businesses continue to thrive and survive, if you will. So make sure you support the local businesses, especially the ones that are still open. And in particular, give a check out to Compass and Demansky. You can contact me for for information about contacting them if needed. Our next show for the Game Sports Show, our, we do have other uploads with Scott and Butch Plants. So keep an eye on that. But our next one here in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario with Riley Brace. We'll have him on next week. And we plan to have a couple more interviews as well. So very happy they're able to join us here tonight. And I'm here to remind you to make sure you keep your stick on the ice, swing your bat, catch your touchdown, drain your threes, and shoot your shots. And before I sign off on that, make sure you stay safe, stay the fuck home, and wash your hands. Booyah.